Hi, everyone, and welcome to Golf's Next Gen, the official podcast of the American Junior Golf Association. I am Tim Jackman, the Vice President of Communications. That is Thomas Harrison, the Director of Tournament Operations. Over there is producer Justin behind the camera, and welcome to another episode. Um, We got a great guest for you today. I'll go ahead and tell you, Shane Bacon joins us um, on the pod, and I'll tell you, we're really excited to chat with him and just kind of hear what he has to say. Um, he actually hosted an AJJ tournament this summer, so that was pretty cool, and played AJJ when he was growing up. So lots of cool stuff coming there with him. Uh, but, Tom, how are we doing today? We're doing great, Tim. It's good to be back. I know we've had a little bit of a, a choppy recording schedule. have been on the road quite a bit, but i um, happy to be back in office, get back in front of the camera, and do a little bit of recording here. Like I said, very excited for Shane. No, heard a lot of great things about his event, so excited to hear about that. And a little bit more about him, but... You know, it feels good. feels good to be back in here. We got our corn. We got this little spinning magnet thing. I'm still not sure what it's called or the what we want book? to call it. The children's book? We do have Shane's a great book. book. Shane will talk about his children's book hopefully a little bit for us. So uh, very excited for everything. Looking forward to a good one. Yeah. You know, before we get to that, you know what we never really talked about was, was the Olympics in any way. Or specifically golf in the Olympics. Mm. Um, and I think it was um, – I forgot. I'm not I'm blanking on who it was, but the conversation was posed basically. Do you do you want Scotty Scheffler's year with the gold medal and you know his the Masters and all that, or do you want Xander Schauffele's year with two majors? And in the 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 choice was the, the two majors, which was really awesome. But I'm curious your thoughts on kind of the weight of the gold medal, um, and kind of what I guess what weight does that carry with you just as the casual golf – well, a little more than casual golf fan, but the golf fan. Yeah, no, I like to think I'm pretty deep in this thing at this point. But <laughs> Serious golf fan? <laughs> Some would say huge golf guy. <laughs> Passionate golf people, fan. People are asking. It's oh. me. I'm people. <laughs> You're but, <free> for life. <laughs> but I do think it's interesting that you bring it up because I saw that conversation as well, and I think I kind of went who's, back and who forth. Who was it with? I, my mind is blanking. It's right been now. posed all over the place. I don't. Whoever wants to claim it to be the okay. original, they can have that conversation. But <laughs> as two guys just purely speculating on the conversation, <laughs> it to me what I think it comes down to. Some people were asking, "Is this like? Do you consider this a fifth major?" Which I think is an interesting argument. I mean, I I personally don't, but I get the weight behind it. Yeah. And I think for me, it seemed like a cool thing, but I kind of wavered because I thought. This is a course that they play on DP World Tour. Mm. It's a field. It's like these are what the PGA Tour and LPGA Tour fields are now. They're international fields with all these top players. So to me, it wasn't necessarily like we're seeing a different field. Obviously, you're seeing a little bit. Some more countries have more representation. Um, there's not for America. You know, we're we're sending out a limited number of golfers instead of, you know, 50, 60 on a, in a given week. But – it seemed like it was more casual than a major to me. I think until I saw Scotty on the podium getting as emotional as he did as they're playing the anthem. And I think that, like, I got some goosebumps as I'm watching it. I was like, that's a cool moment that you don't get at a major. Mm-hmm. So I think, while I don't consider it one of those majors, it's definitely something that's obviously a massive accomplishment. You're a gold medalist. That's something that you can talk about for the rest of your life. I like think Scotty's going to just show up with the tattoo just loud and proud at some <laughs> point like the other Olympians do. But just seeing the emotion behind that and what that meant to him is this is a guy who's put on the green jacket. He's had a phenomenal year. He's had a great career so far. And to see him get that emotional, you know, it's not – you don't see that. So I think it was definitely special, at least for me, just a huge golf guy, being a big fan, seeing the way that that can impact somebody. But – for some of those other golfers too, I mean, it's just putting your flag on on your chest, having that logo. It just you can tell it means so much to them. So I think it's cool. It's just a different experience that you don't always get. Yeah, I think watching Lydia Ko in the same, I mean, in the same kind of vein of what you're talking about. Like, I mean, she was just balling when you know when they played the the Canadian national anthem, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. Well, first of all. I think we can settle the the debate that we sort of had last time about Scotty Scheffler versus Xander Scheffler player of the year. I mean, I think the gold medal kind of just seals that, right? But I think I, don't know. I mean, if Xander comes out, if he wins the FedEx Cup, I think the argument's right back on. <laughs> okay, that's fine. As it stands now, I think we've settled it. But I think 
you know, I was just like look at watching Scotty, you know, stand up there and get emotional. I was like, this is huge impact. And in his interview afterwards, just talking about the, how much that was important to him. And, and that sort of thing. I also love that kind of the field, it is kind of like the, the professional events we see now, but it's also different, right? Because you get some of these, um, you get some of these other countries that maybe don't have as much representation on the tours that were able to participate in golf in the Olympics. So I think from just an overall perspective, I think it's an awesome event. I, I agree. I don't think it's perfectly a major, but I think when you talk about growing the game, I think it's, that's huge for the game of golf because it really provides the opportunity for some, some, Folks that may not have had that opportunity otherwise. So I think that's really cool, the growing the game aspect yeah. of it. No, I think it's just much more a pride thing, too, than mm-hmm. than other events. Because, obviously, you're very proud winning anything. But, like, you're out there competing for something bigger than just yourself at that point. And, like, you're representing your country. You're one of those select few who's chosen. So I think there are some cool moments. I know there was um, the one golfer who – this was, I believe, her second Olympics competing. And in the first Olympics, she had her dad on the bag. And in this Olympics, she mm-hmm. had her mom because she was, like – my dad and I just had, that was the greatest experience we've shared together. Like I want her to be able to experience that as well. So that was super cool. Like see those storylines and everything like that. So, um, it, it's interesting for me. I think you talk about again, massive accomplishment. Technically it's not part of the season. So, you know, where does it kind of fall? But, um, I think there's just so much online for some of those people. I know like we're talking about guys who are hoping to meddle to get out of military service. Yeah, right. And so it's like so you see guys who are, too. yeah, there's so much more than just the golf that comes into this that maybe doesn't come into play in other events. And so until you sit down and really kind of dig deeper into it, I don't think you necessarily appreciate how much it kind of means. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, you know, who knows? I mean, 20, 20 years down the road, we, it may be a different, whole different conversation we're having about it because, you know, maybe as it goes on and as you get more and more more of these golf in the Olympics that you start getting some of that some of that kind of feeling around the event that you have around some of the majors you know maybe that happens and maybe it doesn't but I think it's certainly on a on a path to do that I think over the over the course it may take a while but um considering the fact that you only play it four years but then again maybe like the world cup or you know some of these other things only happen so many every so many years maybe that adds to kind of the mystique of of the event as well so yeah. I don't know. I think it's fun. I think it's awesome that, that golf is in the Olympics. I think it's fun to watch, fun to see kind of the representation there. The the fact that there's not really money on the line, I think is so – it's a, a whole other aspect of it as well. Yeah, and I think part of it too is just – I think, and maybe because this is probably the first Olympics I've been like super into the golf portion of it and really found myself following along, and I felt like it was maybe that way for a lot of people. And I think part of that is kind of a credit to – what's going on with Xander and Scotty, what's going on with Nelly and Rose, the years that they put together, like it brought some excitement as far as, oh, it's not just watching other golf tournament. It's people, whether you're liking a sport or not, when the Olympics come on, like everyone is a proud American who is like die hard for whatever sport. It could be a sport you never even heard of, but you see it and like you're cheering for America to go win. I mean, come on. Did you watch the women's rugby bronze medal game? I mean, I was I was eating dinner one night and equestrian was on behind the bar on you see the TVs and we're just there in the dining area and looking and I'm thinking like all these people are dialed in watching equestrian right now. Right. How many of these people have ever done that in their life but like people are clapping when the score comes up for the American and they're going crazy and I'm like you don't know what that score means. I don't know what that score means but we're loving it. Like we're all about it. Yeah. So I think that just knowing that we had so much firepower going in I think that was cool, and that kind of elevated it, at least here in the States. So hopefully worldwide did the same. I mean, I like to think a lot of those countries, it's it's almost a bigger deal getting those athletes in than it may be here just because we compete internationally so much and so often. Yeah. Um, like you see, it's when we play the Open, all of those same golfers are going over there. They're playing the worldwide competition. But for some of these golfers, this is they're not on a professional tour. This is yeah. their shot. And so if they're playing well, they're competing. That's obviously something that country is going to be glued to. So. Um, it very cool event. It's something that's super cool. It's something I think we all like to imagine, like what would it be like if we were up there on the podium and what would that moment mean to you? So I think it's just cool to visualize. Like I said, I mean, I got goosebumps watching Scotty tear up up there and that's something that I wasn't really expecting. Um, so super cool. Like I said, we always like to think about it. That's where right. Tim, I kind of want to ask you, cause I know this is another question that went around the office during the Olympics. I had a conversation with several people. And I feel like every year at the Olympics, it's the same question everyone talks about. So you get four years 
starting today to train for the next Olympic Games, what do you have the best shot to compete in? I'm not even saying like medal because that's not realistic right, in my opinion. Right. Like it's not. No matter what people want to say, like, oh, I could go medal in this. No, you're not. But what could you have the best <clears throat> chance to compete in? I want to say basketball, but that's false 100%. See, that's when people say something like that. I'm like, I don't think you get how this works. No, like, I, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I think I'm going to say handball. I played a sport rec- serious recreationally in high school and some in college that was very similar. It was a little bit kind of mixed the dodgeball and, and, and oh, so it sounds like you're describing dodgeball. It, yes. But, <laughs> but there was a, there was a, an element of, of a goal to it. Um, so I think, I think handball, I think I would, that would be the one I would choose just um, because I've kind of played it a little bit before and um, I got long arms. So I feel like, that kind of is helpful in that in that sport. Water polo is awesome, but there's no way I could tread water for that long. So, I, I'm gonna go with handball. Yeah, no, I like. I think that's one that comes to mind often too, because I just think of, like, I think you could roll out a baseball team on handball court, and like, obviously, it's gonna take some time to learn the rules, like learn the strategy behind it. But like, there's arm talent to go around. <laughs> right. So that's somewhere like I've thought about that. I think the one that comes to mind for me and i think it's like if i could go back in time so hopefully he's listening off to shoot him a text make sure you listen to this but my buddy sam wakefield and i going way back one of my best childhood friends who grew up together from the time we were in sixth grade to he ended up moving away before our junior year i believe we not once lost a doubles badminton match (laughs) And we would, and like, they weren't close. It's not like we ever had to sweat one out. Like we had our gym teacher who had been there for like 20 plus, I think going on 30 years at that point, who had never lost a match. And we were the first ones to take him and his partner down. (laughs) And like, he was just baffled. Like he retired after that. He like, I, we talked about, I think that's what put him in retirement is we beat him in badminton. So I'd like to think if Sam Wakefield and I stuck with that. So it wasn't like just your class either. It's like you win the class, the top teams from all the classes. And like, we were a wagon. Like, absolute powerhouse. I think Sam Wakefield and I, if we went back and committed to it, gold medalist at some point in our life. <laughs> Not only competing, gold medalist, though. Uh, that's I'm talking you take, like, sixth grade us to now, if that's just all we did, we committed to that. We're competing. Like, we're out there fighting. Is there money in badminton? If there was, I think we would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually generally curious. I don't know. I'm sure there's endorsement deals. I, there has stuff, to be. I mean, so. you can get the racket endorsed. I mean, I would have had a headband. I would have had the sweatband. The headband, going. yeah. Probably yeah. like double arm rat. You can't have the the grip of your racket getting sweaty. So <laughs> there's a lot to it. But Sam, um, if you're listening to this, let's get back into it. I it think I think you. we got a shot. Could've it could have been, been us, man. Could have been you. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, on that note, I think we should move on to Shane Bacon. He's kind of done a lot of different things as well. So um, we'll go ahead and bring him in. Shane, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, no worries. I'm on the road. So uh, sorry if the audio isn't ideal, but uh, the, I wouldn't say the Wi-Fi in my residence in is like top notch, but we'll get through it. Hey, it gets the job done. That's all that matters. Yeah, don't worry. Thomas forgot to hit record two episodes ago on his microphone. So it's, it happens. It, it happens. happens. This is the, well, this I hit record. I just didn't have my microphone hooked up to the the recording app, so that was tough. <laughs> done it a million times. It's it's part of the game, you know. That's how it goes. That's right. Well, first, I think we need to talk about your AJGA career. Let's just get that out of the way. So what do you remember about your AJGA days? Do you remember some of the scores you shot, some of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think it was 22-ish years ago, 23 years ago. I mean, that's, that's kind of wild when you kind of quantify it by that, by that metric. But um, uh, I remember – um, a lot of moments um, in my AJGA career. I remember how impactful AJGA was to me. I was um, I was a middling high school golfer. I wasn't anything special, um, not necessarily special in my um, district in East Texas or anything like that. Um, and I started to play more competitive golf and was playing a lot of Houston Golf Association stuff, things like that. And I, I, I applied to get into the AJGA. I think I was a junior in high school. Um, so I was probably 16, um, going on 17. And got into an event that uh, that summer. So that would have been 01 um, was the year. My first event was in Abilene. And I remember my mom and I went out. I was very nervous. Um, uh, I played a practice run with a couple of kids that went to the Ledbetter School. You know, I was 
I, I, I was very intimidated by that. They had the bags, you know, that was a big deal at the time. Um, and they were obviously polished and, uh, and then I went out in the first round, it was Wendy and Abilene and I went out and just kind of bunted it around and shot, you know, something like 72 ish or something in the opening round. And I was pumped, you know, I, I played well, I didn't embarrass myself. I didn't shoot 80. I think you guys probably both understand that feeling of just don't go shoot a million, you know, and that's kind of the idea of the tournament <laughs> golf. And so I mean, uh, Abilene, Wendy, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's like just kind of part of the name, but, uh, then second round was was one of one of my best uh, one of my best days kind of in my career across all platforms. I shot a I shot a bogey free sixty seven in round two. I think it was low score of the day or close to. Um, I'd never shot a bogey free round before. I don't think I'd shot anything sub sixty nine in my life, recreationally or otherwise. Um, I remember I I think I birdied sixteen. I hit it in the trees on sixteen and hit it close to like two feet. May birdie. And at this point, I'm like out of body experience, you know, I'm, I don't really know what's going on. Like the car is kind of going down the road really fast and I'm just holding desperately with both hands to the steering wheel. And I think I made par on 17. It was a difficult par three and 18. There was water left. I'm a lefty. I hit cuts and, you know, I'm sitting there like, just don't hit in the water. You know, I'm like, I'm like thinking, obviously thinking all this stuff you shouldn't be thinking. And I hit one down the middle of the fairway, hit it on a green. And I remember I'm walking up and this was like a great moment for me. I was walking up. And I remember telling myself, well, at least you're not going to make a bogey. You know, like you hit it on the green. You have 20 feet for birdie or 30 feet oh, for no. birdie. <laughs> and I scuffed the putt and I left it like eight feet short. And I actually made me mad. And uh, and so then I kind of rammed that one in and, and, and didn't make the bogey. But um, I remember I got interviewed like by the Abilene TV channel that night. My my mom at the time, this is to date the the experience, but. My mom went out to the Walmart and bought a VCR so we could we could record <laughs> the interview at our hotel room. Um, who knows where that video is? I'm sure she still has a camera in the house. But uh, oh, we're going to need, need to dig that up. That's <laughs> funny. But um, and then I remember the, le- the next day I was maybe in the second to last grouping or something. And uh, I birdied one as a par five. And I was like a couple shots off the lead and had no idea what to do. And then didn't play very good on the way in and shot maybe 74 ish. and. Um, finished top 10. And as you guys both know, um, having a really good first day GA, GA tournament is huge. I mean, it puts you in a position to um, get invites and opportunity into other tournaments. And then some of the team events, you know, they they know your your resume a little bit more before, you know, obviously being an unknown player. And so it was huge for me. I mean, it gave me a ton of opportunity um, the next year and a half. And um, and yeah, that was my that was my introduction to, to AJGA. Well, Shane, I just want to point out that was some incredible recall right there. Some Sean McVay level stuff. Just, just looking over the sheet. You know that, Thomas. We all remember all this crazy stuff we got. <laughs> I know. That's what I always tell everybody when we're going through scoring. I'm like, everybody remembers every single shot they hit, every single shot everyone else hit. But looking right off the bat, you did go 72, 67, 74. So nailed that on the head. That's incredible. That finished, finished T9, Thomas? T9. T9. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. There you go. Top 10. Yep. That was, that was big. So was see. You were right on, had the year right, the Abilene uh, Reporter News Jr. I mean, that was right on the head. That's some impressive stuff. <laughs> but, Great, I mean, crazy. Going... I think that same that same summer, I I might have, um, I think the same summer I qualified for one of the AJGA majors that year. That was the Lucent Technologies. That was a big deal as well for me because, um, I you know, I mean, it, I hadn't played anything like that. Um, played a super cool golf course in Dallas. I don't think I've ever played it since. I don't really remember what the name of the golf course was, Northwood or something like that. And um, and made the cut, and I was pumped about making the cut in the major, and then finished DFL after I made the cut. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, yeah, I made the cut. I think that was kind of my, my check mark there and did not play well on the weekend. Shot a couple of rounds, high, high 70s, low 80s. But, uh, yeah, Rosenfeld, I think, won that. But any, any, And, I mean, I remember I was looking at the spread, and I'm like, I'm like 30 something shots behind him. I was like, well, there's a different level of player out there right now. You, you made, made it. it. You made it. <laughs> I made it. No. Making the cuts huge. There's one thing I noticed on the card that I've got to ask about. We had a WD that first year. Did we have a little injury problems? What was going on there? Was was that in um was that in Alabama? It was. Yeah, so the that RTJ was golf trail. That was um that was like the most like disastrous weather week ever. They got a ton of rain the week of. I remember, the, I think they hadn't cut the fairways and the greens for like five or six days going into that tournament. 
And um, it kept rolling over and kept rolling over. And there was all these delays. And both my parents were with me. And we had to get back home. Like, my sister had stuff going on. And my dad, I mean, we're, you know, I live in East Texas. We're in Mobile, Alabama, yeah. I think. It was, you know, eight, nine, ten hour drive. And, uh, and I, yeah, I didn't play great the first round. I might have shot, like, 77, 78, something not great. And uh, and then I think round two got delayed into round three, and then round then that got delayed again. And my dad was gonna was gonna drive back to do whatever it was with my sister. I don't remember what it was, and then come back and pick us up. And I think we made a family decision that um, let's save my father twenty five hours in the car, and I'll just go home and lick <laughs> my wounds. But yeah, that was. I will say this too, Thomas. I remember that week. Um, the Rosenfeld moment at the major was crazy, but. I remember it was it was hot in Alabama. I mean, you know, kind of like what Tim said about Wendy and Abilene. I mean, it was hot, hot, hot in Bama that week. And it was hot. It was muggy. It had been so rainy. And I remember I was walking to the range, and I walked by Casey Wittenberg, and he was wearing pants. He was wearing, like, the Duvall wraparounds and pants. And I'm like, this dude's, this dude's serious, man. He's, He's different. different. <laughs> you know, like, this guy's got it, got it in him. So, um, you know, you just remember those little moments. Uh you know, you fast forward to whatever 04 and Wittenberg's in a bundle cabin with Phil and, you know, he's low am and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew, I kind of had a feeling that kid would be good. <laughs> Dang. Okay. So it kind of came full circle for you this summer though, with hosting an AJGA tournament. Talk to me a little bit about that and what led you to that point. Yeah. I mean, it was always something I was interested in. I'd seen Max did it uh, in California. I know some of the players have gotten involved in it. Um, I didn't know if there'd been many media people that have been interested in doing something like that. I think there'd been, I think Will Lowry might've done something with the AJGA mm-hmm. um, who, who's a good dude and, and obviously does a ton for golf. And so I kind of cold reached out to the AJGA and asked if there was any interest in something like that. Um, they kind of immediately got back to me. I, I'll say this, the crew at the AJGA is dialed. I mean, no matter what time of year you send them a note or an email, um, they'll get back to you. They're on top of stuff, which is really cool. Um, it's an organization I respected before working alongside them for something. And, uh, my respect level went up even more than I already had to begin with. So, um, just reached out. There's a golf course in East Texas that I've always felt like would be a good test for anybody that played any level of competitive golf. It's called Pine Dunes, the middle of nowhere, Texas. Um, but it's a sweet golf course. I'd played it for a lot of years, um, kind of into high school and beyond. We'd always come back and play it. So I always had this dream of having a junior golf tournament there. And so, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I thought it'd be cool to be a part of it, just to kind of see how the whole process worked. Um, the team does so much. I mean, as long as you're not a bumbling idiot, I mean, you can kind of, you know, ride alongside their coattails and do a, and do a half decent <laughs> job. So um, that was fun there. You know, what's funny is, you know, you do anything you guys I mean, have done a million things like this as well, but you do it the first year and the moment you leave, you go, okay, I want to do this different next year and this different yeah, yeah. Um, and all that level of stuff. But, you know, I mean, it was so cool. I got a couple of exemptions and got to give those out to um, a couple of juniors in the East Texas area. One of them is the son of um, this football coach in Carthage, Texas, who is now, I think, maybe the most decorated college uh, high school football coach in Texas high school football history. That's how good Carthage football is. His son, I think, is the quarterback of that team and also a really good golfer. He shot something dirty on the first round. He shot like 68 or 69 in the opening round. But you know, just just those types of things. Had a kid um, from Mexico come up to me one of the days and said, um, you know, my dream is to play an AJGA tournament. This one popped up and I jumped right in. And I think he went through qualifying and got in. So, you know, I mean, it's just, again, it was a big part of my junior experience and a big part of my life kind of coming up in the ranks and seeing the different levels of competitive golf. So to be able to, in a very small way, in a very small part, you know, be a part of that experience for juniors out there and and to see a good tournament and good representation across the country and things like that. It was, it was awesome. No, that's very cool. And obviously we really appreciate you coming on board and everything you did. And you mentioned you see these things now that you want to do for next year. Can we get a little sneak peek into what does that Shane Bacon Jr. look like in 2025? Yeah, so um, one thing I'm gonna I'm gonna be involved in is the gear. You know, I do the gear stuff for my guys' golf trip every year, and um, it's like a. I mean, it's embarrassing how much time I spend on this. I mean, the I, like I would argue that the golf gear my buddies get on our yearly trip is would rival any golf tournament that exists on the planet. I mean, last year we had Good Boy Original Prince and. 
Um, you know, we've got like Bubba I mean, I got a Bubba stick right here that, you know, we've got colorways on it and it's got the, you know, Southwestern style. I mean, I'm always trying to think of like cool things that golfers would want in their bag. So I would say that's one of the things I'm really focused on. We're going to do a logo through my logo company um, for the tournament next year. So we can get that kind of on the towels, the official towel, stuff like that. But um, those are a couple of things. Um, and I think the last might be just a little closer to home. Um, Thomas, I think maybe just somewhere in the Connecticut area. I talked to my club about it already. Um, so getting those discussions going and just finding a place that um, maybe in the 110 degrees, I think would also be kind of helpful <laughs> to the juniors involved and maybe the parents following. So, um, you know, just a, a few things like that. But Pine Dunes was awesome. I mean, they did a great job. They, you know, it, it's funny. You get on a few phone calls with the clubs and you talk to them and then you talk to Jody on the back end of it. And she says how excited, you know, they were to have the kids out there and the feedback and you get the thank you notes from the players that I know you guys ask and, and urge the juniors to do. But a lot of the messages you could tell weren't just, hey, Mr. Bacon, thank you. I mean, heartfelt stuff on there, um, which, you know, I mean, it goes a long way to, to let people know that you care about um, the hard work that went into it. So, yeah, just just got some I got some ideas flowing. I might have a notes, uh, a notes list or two going on on what I think could be some cool stuff for the kids next year. No, that's always cool to hear. As Tim and Justin hear me talk about all the time, I like to think I'm an ideas guy. So <laughs> knowing that you're on that same page, working to make it happen, love to see that. That's something that Thomas, I love what's your, you what's your, your notes app? Do you, do you go notes app? What do you do? How, how do you how do you handle your ideas? Uh, typically, I just call Tim and he knows that something <laughs> is happening. I'm, I'm like, Tim, Tim I'm, I'm not sure. sure. I just got to write it down. I yeah. have a notes app for Thomas. <laughs> typically what happens is like, Tim, I've got this idea. And he just goes, oh, no. I said, it might sound crazy, but I know we can get there. <laughs> I'd say, I mean, it's oh, some yeah. of the most fun things in the world is to go from idea to finish point And you get to see how it turned out. Or um, I do that a lot with the logo stuff with, with Ground Under Repairs. I'll like mock something up with a pen and piece of paper and then send it to the actual artists that have like, you know, creative abilities and things like that. And when it comes back, I'm like, never show this piece of paper to anybody ever again. Like that was a very, <laughs> very poor representation of what I was trying to put and get across here. That's so good. I like how you mentioned too, like once you do the tournaments one time, and a lot of times I think we see it with the golf courses we go to, they, they, we talk about it and we hype it up and we say how great it is. And then they actually do it. And they're just like, why didn't you tell us? And we're, we tried, but you know, you've got to get one in and that's why there's such a great jump from year one to two with a lot of our events because that exact reason you said. So that's well, awesome. Get an, get an eyeball on it. It's, uh, it's cool. And, and, you know, I mean, again, I like, I mean, I remember like AJGA towels, for instance, right. I mean, they've been a staple for decades um, around the AJGA and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a look at me thing um, that's simple and subtle with a golf bag. Right. I'm um, getting the ones with your tournament's name on them. Um, I've been using them now, you know, for the last couple of months. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's a cool thing. And, and you spice them up just a little bit here and there. And, uh, and you know, now now there's going to be juniors across the country that are rocking them. I mean, you know, it's just little subtle things like that that are uh, that are a big part of the golf tournament and the and the organization and, um, and what you're doing in terms of your involvement. So, you know, it's as simple as a golf towel can be spiced up a little bit, too. Now, I love that you mentioned the towel because I think back to my intern days when I was first starting out and I had heard of the AJGA just being a golf fan. But the first thing I learned from players and other people was like the towel is the important thing. Like you said, kids are going to they're going to rep the towel. They're going to have it on the bag with the bag tag and they're going to see like, oh, you played in the Shane Bacon Jr. You played in this tournament like that's a it's a huge status symbol. Yeah. Um, the bat. You know, what's interesting. I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, Thomas. I'm glad you brought up the bag tag. Um, so the adult version of the AJGA bag tag is the airline status bag tag they send you. <laughs> that's what the that's yeah, what yeah. adults do. So it's like I'm down diamond medallion, a Delta, and they put it on their bag. It's like no reason to put it on there except for just to kind of subtly <laughs> brag about how much you fly or your status with an airline. I mean, that's yeah. the adult comp to, to the, you know, I play AJGA golf as a junior. <laughs> You're hoping some guys in the jet bridge, like you see that, that guy's got plans. Like he's that guy travels. That guy flies a million miles. My goodness. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service. How, uh, you know, you mentioned your, the logo company that you, you have, how did that come about? I know that's kind of an interesting partnership there. Uh, talk about that. Yeah. Um, I've always been obsessed with golf course logos. I mean, I'm, let me just give you an example of, um, how like much of a loser I am. I'm in Florida for five days. I mean, this is how many hats I brought, and I'm wearing another one. I mean, 
like logos and golf logos are kind of a big part of um, of so much about what golf is, right? I mean, it tells a story of the golf course and a lot of the times, the, the great ones do at least. But, you know, it's, I'm getting older. You go on these golf trips with your friends, like that's what you buy and that's what you take home. And that's when you put the shirt on or the hat or the ball marker. Um, you pull that out and you remember the trip. You remember the moments with your friends and stuff like that. There are a lot of bad logos out there. And um, I knew as golf was growing, um, rebranding some of these clubs that built logos in the 90s that maybe were pulled in and that have been a little dated. Um, I knew there was going to be some opportunity there. And then I ran into Kate Smith, um, who I do the logo company with, uh, on Twitter. She was a, she was still in college at the time, finishing up her time in Nebraska playing collegiate golf. Uh, and then I saw her kind of burst on the scene playing well at the ANWA. And um, I ended up just kind of cold reaching out to her on Twitter and said, do you have any interest in doing this when you're done? Like, I've always wanted to find somebody to do this alongside. And she was right in right away. And so um, we threw around some ideas. She got out of college. She wanted to play pro. You know, I said, you know, you're playing pro golf. You're going to have some, do some, you're going to have free time to do this. I'm on the road. And then when you're home and stuff like that, and it might be a way to support if, you know, if we start to make any money or whatever. Um, I mean, as you guys know, you know, the mini tour live, Epson tour, things like that. Um, she just had her best finish last week. She finished fourth. You can make money when you finish fourth, but if you're finishing 20th or 30th, it's yeah. tough to make enough money to maybe support your dreams. And so I thought it might be a way that she could support her dreams for a little bit longer or whatever the case may be. And yeah, you know, we're three years in, we're rocking and rolling. We've done some designs for some big clubs and some big names um, in the business, but we've also done a hundred buddies trip logos. You know, I mean, we do anything from the smallest logos um, to, I mean, we, we've worked with a golf ball company and, you know, I think our logo is on like 10 million of their golf balls, you know, so, you know, you kind of go from the biggest projects to the smallest ones and put the same um, emphasis into both. And I mean, it's sweet. Like my wife helps out with the company. Her husband helps out with the company. Um, so it's a small kind of collaborative crew. But, uh, you know, again, bringing an idea to life and helping a golf course uh, kind of rebrand itself and make it a logo where people want to buy the hat is uh, it's fulfilling and it's fun. No, Shane, I think it's genius because we kind of alluded to it going back to the towels, things like that. I think for whatever reason, more than any other sport or industry, golf people are the biggest logo people on the planet. Like all you want to do is go to a club, get the logo on a polo, on a hat, and you just want to go show it off. Like you're walking around hoping somebody's asking you about it. That's just, it's such a big part of the game. I think that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a buddy of mine text me a hat this morning. Um, absolutely sick hat, like the best hat ever. And, um, and you know, you're, you're like looking at it and you're going, I need to, I got to go play there. You know, like I want to go play the golf course, but I also want to buy, you know, a hundred million dollars of stuff in the shop, you know? So <laughs> That's awesome. I don't, I, maybe we'll get into a different conversation about the AJJ logo later, but uh, we'll move on for now. <laughs> okay. 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 We can move on. <laughs> Um, how, how did you kind of get to, can you talk a little about your career arc and kind of how you got to this point? You know, obviously you played junior golf and then you kind of moved through, but talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, a uh, I went to school to write, uh, well, I went to school to do broadcasting, but, um, I asked a broadcaster at the time when I was in high school, the best path to kind of get to that position. He said, go learn how to write. It's very helpful for TV. So um, went to school to write, uh, wrote for the student newspaper at Arizona for four years, uh, wrote golf a lot, wrote some other sports as well, had a column, things like that. Uh, got out of college, tried to play pro golf for a couple of years. That went about as well as you'd expect. And when that, uh, when I learned I wasn't going to make money doing that, it's like, what's the next best thing? And so that was like 07-ish, 08, um, started a blog, um, was writing you know, seven, eight, nine posts a day on it. You know, I mean, you know, getting a little bit of traffic, started to get a little bit more traffic. And then from there started to get linked. The 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 stuff young people don't understand, um, that was a big deal back in the day was like getting linked on another website. So places like Deadspin or um like Fan House and, and these places would have these blog roles and they would link, you know, every day to five stories or whatever. And I started to get my stuff linked um when golf things were popping. And so I ended up reaching out to a company and said, can I work for you guys? And they hired me part-time and then full-time. Um, so yeah, I got into the business that way and then slowly worked my way up, you know, as it goes. I mean, worked for Yahoo Sports and, and AOL and then worked for CBS Sports and then got my first TV job in 2014 um, with a startup network called the Back Nine Network. And then from there, 
got into the live stuff with Fox. So yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's funny, right? It's right place, right time. I mean, I was at a company that didn't last very long in 2014 into 2015, right when Fox got the TV contract with the USGA. And when they got the contract with the USGA, they were looking for some young people to come do some of the digital broadcasting. And so I was kind of around in the right place. So uh, got into that. And then um, from there kind of expanded in and around Fox. And, um, you know, I got into the podcasting world pretty early. I think I was, it was no laying up, had a pod. And I think I was behind them uh, maybe a year or so. And so there weren't a lot of golf podcasts out there at the time. And uh, back then you get anybody. I mean, my early clubhouse podcast days, like you go back and look at the archives of that podcast. I mean, Ricky yeah, I and that. Bryson and Brooks. And uh, I remember Rory was on one time and he was hurt and he mentioned he was returning to Doral and ESPN's bottom line clicker had, uh, you know, Rory tells the clubhouse with Shane Bacon. I was like, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> I'm there. And, uh, yeah, there you go. So um, kind of the path is, is, was just, you know, I, 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 wrote a lot to get into TV and then I did a lot of TV stuff, um, to move up. And then, you know, I, I become, um, a little bit more of kind of a hybrid, uh, person in golf where I do some live broadcasting, you know, I do all the corn Ferry um, for PJ tour entertainment. Um, that's on golf channel. I do, you know, some of the major work for some of those networks, but I do a lot of, um, individualized kind of a uh, one-off idea stuff that I'll really, really like doing. And I've been working with the fried egg, um, big fan of Andy, big fan of their team as well. Um, the whole crew is so talented and so smart over there. So, you know, it's been fun. I mean, getting a chance to, to do a lot of the stuff with ping has been cool. Uh, they've been a company that I have been playing since I was, I don't know, like 15, 16. I mean, I remember, you know, the hoofer bags when I was at the AJGA, it's like everybody had one and, um, so to get a chance to kind of start out the podcast with ping and work with that whole crew has been super cool. So yeah, yeah. You know, like this, this industry evolves a lot and that's something that I've learned and had to, um, uh, be nimble with and it's ever changing and you're even seeing it now, right? I mean, this YouTube golf thing is now the thing and it happened quickly. I mean, even a year and a half ago, I'm not sure we knew some of the names we know of now. And so just trying to kind of stay ahead of it in some capacity and then still do some of the stuff you love doing is basically kind of the chair I sit in right now. Yeah, that's what we try to tell. We have, I mean, you met some of our interns at your event. You know, we have about a hundred different interns a year and we try to, that's something we talk about a lot is, you know, it's not just golf is not just about, you know, playing golf, right? There's so many other ways you can get involved. And we talk about this with a lot of our juniors who maybe aren't, you know, the top tier players, there's so many other different things you can do in golf because if you love the sport, like you can carry that into so many different ways, kind of like you're saying. So I really like that. That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's the only sport really, when you think about it, you know, it's the only sport that when you're 40 and 50 and 60, you can watch it, pay attention to it. You can compete in it. You can still love traveling with it. Like all of those, all of the parts of every other sport that eventually go away, maybe when you're 18, Maybe when you're 25, definitely when you're 30, right? We're not playing pickup hoops at 35. I'm not, at least. I I had my last pickup hoops injury and I was done. I mean, those oh, things are eventually, yeah, they 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 go. I remember I, I texted I texted Terry Gannon probably three years ago. So I'm, I was probably 37, and I said I think I'm going to get back to pickup, and he was like, "Don't do it, dude. Like, just don't. <laughs> dude. Just I'm telling you, don't do it." I was like, "All right, I won't." But um. You know, all those all those other sports go away and then the interest of keeping up with basketball shoes or, you know, paying attention to fantasy baseball, even those things will eventually dry up. But I feel like with golf, the passion and the love just continue to grow with age, you know, and um, and so that's why it's, you know, in my opinion, the the most it's the most unique sport for sure across the board. And, and it's definitely the coolest if you're into it. Yeah, no, it's super cool. And I feel like for somebody like yourself, who's been on so many sides of it, having played golf, you were a caddy for a period of time, moving into the media segment. I mean, you're just so well rounded. I feel like that had to give you kind of an advantage as you've moved through here. You just you can relate to so many people. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I I've been I've been lucky in in the sense that certain things I decided to do when I was a young person, to Tim's point about like so many young people in and around the AJGA, it's like some of the kind of fork in the road moments 
I said yes to those moments. And at the time I didn't realize it mattered. And then now at this point, I'm very happy that I, I said yes versus no. I mean, same thing with the, the caddy and on the LPJ tour. I mean, my friend, Erica Blasberg, I remember reached out to me and said, I'm not playing great. I'm just trying to have a friend on the bag. Would you loop for me? And I remember I reached out to the company I was writing for the time and said, would you guys want some like blog posts about me caddying a couple of events? They were like, sure, do it. And so I did that. And again, it's, it's, it's being in that world, even for a brief moment, it allows you to see a little bit about what those people go through on a day-to-day -day basis. It's understanding the process of what a professional caddy looks like, what they're doing on the green. I mean, as little as me being the host on TV and seeing a caddy on the corner of the, of the shot, stepping off a pin for the next day, I know, I know what they're doing. Now I'm sure plenty of people out there do as well, but when I first started caddy and I was like, what the hell is this guy doing on a Friday? And like, what's, why is he over there? You know, this is, crazy and then you realize they're 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 working on their job for the next day so um yeah i mean again it like i don't want to give myself too much credit because at the time you don't realize what it could lead to but there are definitely moments i'm happy that i did it um that when i look back on it i'm happy i did it um, and it is cool you mentioned those little things that you pick up on but um something that a lot of people may not know about your career we talk about being well-rounded i don't know how many people have played been a caddy, been on the media side, and now turned published author. We uh, wanted, wanted to go, go ahead, ahead and discuss. discuss. Look at you. We went ahead, got a copy of the book. We had to, we had to deep dive. And so the golfer zoo, Shane, why don't you tell us a little bit about where that idea came from and how you got into that process of writing a children's book? Well, I mean, the idea came from a hole in the market, honestly. I mean, I, I had a kid and, um, you know, you, you're in the golf world, you get golf stuff sent to you. You know, it's like my mom is a bacon. You know, she would get pig stuff sent to her for a long time. She finally had to be like, stop sending me pig gifts. Like, I get it. My last name's Bacon. Um, when you're a golfer. Sounds like a great, great problem. problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, she, I, I, listen, it, at one point, it was like our entire kitchen wall was like pig stuff. She's like, I'm out of I'm out on this. Give me something new. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, we had, I had my first son um, in, uh, in 2019, and there was no kids children's golf books sent to us. And so I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, did some deep diving. There's a couple out there, not a lot. So I went, you know, I mean, I, I always kind of had this idea of like the golf course is kind of a zoo anyway. I mean, every golf course you go to has different animals or, you know, you go north, you might see a bear, you go southeast, you might see an alligator, you go to Arizona, you might see a snake. Like it's a part of the golf course, right? I mean, we all watch the African Open every year on Golf Channel in the mornings and you're like, there, I've never even seen half these animals in my life and they're out <laughs> on a golf course right now and like the pros are having to dodge them. So, um, that was a little bit of where the idea came from. And then, um, I reached out to, to Jim at back nine press, who has been an awesome partner on it and said, would you be interested in helping me out, you know, doing this? I didn't know how to publish a book, you know, I mean, Google, how to publish a book, it's like, you know, good luck. And so, um, he was a great, great, great guide in that world. And, um, I wrote up a few iterations of it and, um, we found a great, great, uh, artist in Europe to help us out. And. Yeah, I mean, it. you know, you. it's, uh, again, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, Tom, it's just like, I have this idea, and then, you know, you get the box in the mail, and it shows up at your house, and you're like, well, this is crazy. And then, you know, what, what, what has been so cool, and it's, it's probably my favorite thing I've done in my career is the book, simply because I get so many messages on Instagram and Twitter from moms and dads that'll say, this is my kid's favorite book, or... This is the book my kid reaches for every night. The ironic part about it is my son, who was in theory the inspiration for the book, never asked to read it once, not one time. <laughs> I would occasionally bring it up and he would just be like, no, I'm good. And then my daughter, <laughs> who is now two, went on like a six month run where it was every night, dad a book, dad a book, dad a book. And I was like, finally, somebody likes the book <laughs> at my house because I was like, maybe, maybe this book stinks, you know, maybe nobody likes it. And, uh, and so my daughter brought me back and, and, and she has now doubly grabbed my heart. So, uh, so she's, I mean, it's funny, she would like sleep with it in her crib and stuff, which is cute. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the re the outreach from friends and, and people online and, and, uh, and, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's super cool. I do, uh, I do speak in during the master's week, um, for this company called Inspirato and, uh, they've been kind enough the last couple of years. Um, I'll do a couple of nights of speaking at their dinners for them, just talking about the week and the master's things like that. 
And the last couple of years, they bought copies of the book for everybody there. And it's, it's, it's mostly an older crowd. You know, it's, it's older parents or grandparents and they will bring their book up. I mean, there'll be 200 people in the room and I'll sign 200 of them all to, you know, their grandkid, the name, all that stuff. And, you know, it's, you know, when that book's going away, it's going to some kid and maybe 20% of them care about it. But if 20% of them care about it and then 10% of them maybe take it a step further and they want to go to the golf course with mom and dad and see if there's animals out there and 5% of those people play golf, you know, maybe you've, maybe 50 people are playing more golf a year because of the book, you know? So, I mean, maybe it's small, but it's not nothing. And, uh, and it's, it's just, you know, again, it's, it's cool to, to have a book on the shelf and, uh, and I love kind of hearing from people that have read it. Yeah. I think I have, three boys and it's really interesting like I, we were given a oh, golf you have three boys book. Jeez, damn, you look like you're like 24 yeah yeah <laughs> uh, 33 but you know close enough that's what he's not 35 yet he's still playing pickup ball <laughs> so good Jeez, what's this skincare regimen yeah, do it. <laughs> uh sunscreen <laughs> okay, you look great you look just great anyway go ahead sorry well thank you we need to have him on more often. I love well, this. I, again, glad you mentioned it because the first time I met Tim, I thought he was an intern. Yeah, and at this point, point he was already – I'm shocked by the three kids. This is this is flooring me right now. <laughs> well, well, as I was saying, um, they uh, – I think we were given a kid's book with my oldest, and he's, he's almost six now. But um, it was like this very odd – weirdly illustrated like children's book and I was like this is I appreciate the gesture but it's just kind of weird so you know when we got your book and I was reading through it, I was like this is the type of children's book you know I want about golf you know because the other one I think was about these weird outfits and stuff and it was just I was like okay <laughs> just trying to find some golf connection I mean everybody out there is trying to do it I, I uh I was on pardon my take a couple of months ago and big cat um my wife you know is is so good at, at helping with with so many things but um, I told her when we when we had the book published, I said, let's send it like, let's get nice packaging. Because, again, I mean, to Thomas's point about ideas, like ideas come from experience, right, for the most part. And I get stuff in the mail a lot of the time and sometimes it's just in a box and that's fine. I mean, it's not a big deal, but can you beautify it a little bit? And so my wife did like this great job of packaging the book in these pretty packages. And we sent it to a few people, you know, friends of ours in the media. And, you know, I mean, one person shouts it out. It's worth your time. And. Um, I was on part of my take uh, a couple of months ago in Big Cat's like, first things first, we love the book. It's too long, but we love the book. I was like, and then I remember our publisher that day is like, we got 50 orders today on the line. I was like, that's the power of part of my take, man. Those people don't mess around. You got those dedicated fans, man. I mean, that seems like the perfect kind of length for them, honestly. I feel like that's a that was a good move on your part. Like you said, you know those that's are guys who are going to read I mean, it. I can't shortchange the game, you know. <laughs> You know, by the time that you're done with the book, the kid's sleepy enough, he's going to go to bed. So, that, see, see, Tim is a dad. Tim does have <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Shane, we really appreciate you coming on today and, you know, chatting through a bunch of different stuff with us. Certainly appreciate your support of the AJGA, both as a player and then obviously through hosting your tournament and then, uh, you know, coming on with us. So, thanks for doing that. And thanks for all you're doing for growing the game through the book and, and you know, through the media and all that as well. Appreciate it, guys. I'm looking forward to 25. But like I said, I'm I gotta I gotta figure out we gotta figure the golf course out first. That's that's uh, number one uh, number one thing to tackle. And once we get that uh, dialed in, then we can start to have a little bit of fun. But looking forward to it, and uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Shane. Like I said, just can't echo what Tim said enough. Just all the support means a lot. Love hearing that the ideas are flowing. We'll get the golf course in place and just let it roll from there. They won't be ready for it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks, Shane. You have a great rest of your day. For sure, guys. Thank y'all. Thank you very much, Shane Bacon, for coming on the podcast. I mean, Tim, I don't know about you, but I just really enjoy hearing about all of his experiences because he's just done so, so much, much in the industry yeah. that he's seen all sides of it. And that's something that I think is great. Hopefully um, our juniors or any listener for that matter can take away. Like there's, there's a life after playing golf. And I think he yeah. really embodies that. So that was super cool to hear from him. Great guy who's done a lot of things. So I um, really appreciate Shane for taking the time to come join us. Uh, but before we wrap up today, just had a few questions from some of our listeners. Um, and so, Tim, I just want to hop into it. We got a couple here for you. 
Um, but our first question comes from Bailey, and she was wondering, what should I expect to see when I arrive on site at my first tournament? That's a great question. Um, so really, it starts before you even arrive on site at your first tournament. You know, you're going to get a lot of communication from the tournament director about, you know, a lot of different things, whether that's, you know, booking the host hotel, where the golf course is, signing up for a practice round. All of that information is going to be communicated on the front end from the tournament director. And um, once you get all that info, you can see the schedule of events and you can see more specifics about all that. So you're going to arrive on site at your first event, check what time uh, tournament registration is. That's going to be very important to know that. And you're going to arrive at tournament registration. You're going to be um, checked in there. They're going to ask you some questions about some of um, what you're doing, where you're staying, if you rented a car to get there, that sort of thing. And all the, that information is basically for us so that we can provide it to um, whether it's the local convention and visitors bureau or if it's a specific sponsor, the host hotel. We a lot of times can work out special rates at these hotels if we're able to guarantee a certain amount of people there. So these are all different things why we ask those questions. Then you're going to get your gifts. So whatever gifts those may be, shirt, balls, towel, you know, whatever it is there. Um, then you're going to be able to play in your practice round. If it's a tea time um, event, then you're going to obviously have a tea time or maybe a shotgun where you'll play um, and you'll you'll kind of play those rounds. At some point during that practice round, we're going to try to get your equipment survey, which is uh, something that we do, which is very helpful for us when we're talking to our sponsors and able to retain a lot of those sponsorships because of some of that data that we pull. So they're going to ask you a lot of different questions. <laughs> I think you know, Thomas, how many different questions that we ask. Anything from balls to gloves, I mean, shoes, shorts, hat. Definitely condense it down than my time here, but it's a basically just a big what's in the bag. You know, <laughs> You're right. We, just, we want to do an in-depth what's in the bag. So it's your time to shine. Um, I know those are very popular on social media. I find myself in the rabbit hole of anytime I see a what's in the bag, I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty intrigued here. So. Right. Right. So we'll get that. Um, we'll get that as well. Get Try to get that out of the way during the practice round or, or before the first round. And then you're going to have your rounds. We're going to announce you on the starting tee, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, for all of the competitive rounds, you're going to get announced your name in your hometown. So that's really awesome. and Get a chance for um, people to clap for you. And then you're going to play some golf. And after the round is over, we have a scoring tent where all the players are going to go and they're going to do their scores. And then, um, and then you'll be done for the day and we'll do it all the next day. And then uh, another really cool thing at the end of the tournament – the award ceremony, we uh, are going to give out the awards to top five boys, top three girls, depending on the event. It may be different. Um, and then we're going to give the champions an opportunity to do a speech, which is, you know, most of them are, are pretty nervous for. But they uh, that's a great development opportunity for them as well, and they can get a chance to thank some people. So that's kind of the the synopsis of what an AJJ tournament experience is like. A lot of ways to grow and a lot of opportunities there. So it's a good question. Oh, very cool. I think you nailed on the head. It's like you've been to a tournament or two in your day. Um, mm. I've been a, I have, fun fact I've been to just over a hundred now so oh, look at that I know very fun fact I don't even I'd have to go back and do some digging to figure out how many I've been to but I have a list kind of lost track see I should have but I feel like I'm too late now so. <laughs> nonsense we'll figure it out eventually but. okay so it's your turn to answer a question um, this one is from Troy what is a consistent score for a ch- a junior, a junior to be considered for a D1 recruit or considered as a D1 recruit. Um, so love this question from Troy, because this is a question I get a lot from parents on site, um, parents of young men and women who are hoping to play Division One golf or just college golf in general. Um, and something that I think is maybe one of the most valuable things we provide through the Junior Plus membership um, is access to this database called the College Golf Guide. Uh, so the College Golf Guide was created by Rich Brazzo, who's actually a former AJJ intern. He went on, he coached at West Point um, for several years, and then moved into um, being a college golf advisor for um, a lot of our players and any player in general. Um, and so basically what he does is give you kind of that roadmap to college golf. Um, but one of the tools that I think is super cool on his website, and I've gone on and just played around with in general just because I think it's very interesting, is he has compiled – a database where you can go in and search based on obviously like what level you're looking for D one, two, three, NAIA, JUCO, um, whatever your preference is, you enter your test scores, you can enter like proximity to you, but then you enter like your average score and you can select the one through five, um, obviously on a golf lineup, like say I want to like, I shoot consistently. My average is 75. I'm going to put that in there and search based on my other criteria, test scores, and that is going to tell me where I could go and play. 
And so obviously that's not, you just send this and they're automatically going to give you a scholarship, <laughs> but it gives you a good idea of where to look and who to contact because it's showing you, like, especially if you want to go somewhere and play, it shows you like, all right, if I'm averaging 75, all right, the three man at this school is averaging 78. Mm-hmm. That means the coach is probably going to give me a good look if they were to get their hands on some of my information. So um, super cool tool, but um, it's obviously, it's going to vary just depending on where you want to go, the level of program. Um, if you're at one of a power five school versus a mid major and some of those different things, obviously there's so many different levels amongst D one golf right. or all the levels of college golf. Uh, but it's just something where you just input your information and it's going to tell you right away. Yeah. Um, so I think it's super cool tool. I said, go on there, play around with it. Again, that's the college golf guide. Um, and it is a perk that you get with our junior plus membership. So Definitely take advantage of that if you have not already. And I encourage everyone to do that as they're navigating the recruiting trail, because I know it's something where maybe you have your dream school and it'll tell you if you click on it, it'll tell you what you would need to go play at your dream school. So that's something as well. Give you some goals if you're on the outside kind of looking in there of, you know, what do I need to get to to make this realistic and make this a possibility? So um, super cool. Really, really enjoy that and would highly recommend that. Yeah, great question, Troy. Yeah, really like that. That's something that I said. Once I discovered, I went around and played around on there as if I was going to go compete (laughs) and play college golf, but um, I certainly enjoy it. So very cool. Make sure you check that out. Um, But one more for you, Tim, before we wrap up here. Um, This one comes from Maria, and she just want to know, what are both of your favorite AJGA tournaments? Oh, this is a really hard question to answer. I think just from an overall perspective – I think I would have to say the 2019 Junior President's Cup, if we're going to get specific to an event, not like a series of events. Um, it was in Australia. It was uh, that we actually played Royal Melbourne, um, where they played the President's Cup that year. So we played it a couple of days before. And I distinctly remember, you know, driving around, setting up the golf course with Andrew Greenfield, who's the tournament director for that event, and just being like, are we literally just driving on this golf course right now? Like, three days before the president's cup competes on it. Like it was just a surreal experience. Plus just being there. And I mean, in the, any of those sand belt golf courses in Australia are just insane. They're beautiful, but they're the most insane test of golf ever. Um, I think the whole thing was just awesome. The experience for the players, the experience for the staff. It was just a really, really awesome thing. No. Super cool. I mean, that's one, um, uh, was fortunate enough to visit Australia, um, before I freshman year of high school on this little student exchange, uh, people to people. And so, didn't get to see any golf or anything out there, but I can only imagine just based on some of the views and some of the places I got to go that yeah, that would that be place. just an unreal experience. They loved my accent there, which is pretty cool. See, they I think the funniest part for me was when I went to Australia, they said in direct quote, you don't sound like Hannah Montana. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was what they were like almost wildly disappointed. This host family was like, you don't sound like Hannah Montana. Like, what's... We got a defective one. Maybe maybe <laughs> I sound more like Hannah Montana. <laughs> I'm just, that's that's yeah. awesome. I will never forget that moment because I looked and I was like, I'm sorry. I got, <laughs> my bad. That and they loved goldfish crackers. That's my two things. The family wow. I stayed with, the children loved them to death. They were great. But the kids, kids were obsessed with goldfish, goldfish crackers. So Hannah Montana, yep. goldfish staples of the australian okay. childhood are you gonna actually answer this question or are you gonna just diatribe about your high school days uh, we were talking i mean we are high school heavy on on the episode <laughs> but uh glory days man <laughs> uh i think for me my favorite ajga tournament and i think it depends on how i want to describe like favorite like favorite place yeah. i've been to yeah. all that stuff but one that comes to mind that i think is just like my coolest experience is being down at mayacoba um in Mexico, outside of Cancun there, El Camilleon. With producer Justin? With producer Justin. He has gotten to experience uh, my homeland down there. And I just, I love everything about it. The people are great. The golf course, it was huge for the Federation, the Mexican Golf Federation. They wanted to bring something like that down to Mexico. Um, and so it took a lot of work on the front end to get it up and running. I know there were a lot of questions about what it would look like. And then after year one, I don't think anybody had any doubt. They were looking like, this thing is awesome like everyone here is 100 percent all in we'll do whatever they can to make it the best experience so um, that's one i definitely have circle on the calendar every year love that event um, abraham answer came on board this year so that was very cool having him on site as well i know he it was really neat for him to be able to kind of see that all in motion so very special to me love that one but there's a lot of great tournaments i mean every every tournament has its own little unique yeah. thing that kind of makes it special but uh, that's one that definitely always stands out you didn't mention the mariachis 
the mariachi that's the hidden gem i mean the the mariachi welcome party i'd like to incorporate that into more events personally <laughs> but that's just me um we'll see where we go with that in 2025 but <laughs> <laughs> all right now. Sounds good. Well, that's all we got uh, for this episode, Thomas. Thanks for your time today. Um, if you, if the listeners got any other questions, you can find us on social media. It's at AJGA Golf. That's going to be on X, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram. Yeah, that one too. Um, so definitely check out the social media. Send us a DM. Let us know about questions. Um, we're always asking for those. Also check out our other episodes and other, other stuff we got going on social. But that's all I got, Thomas. Hey, appreciate it, Tim. Another good one. Like I said, good to be back. Yep, good to be back. You have a good rest of your day, folks. See you guys.